be my eigenvalues, um, which I don't actually, I won't actually have you calculate them that way. Um, but what we, how we will calculate them, if you remember our, our Moore's circle here in 2D, do, 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 stress, strain, um, these two points are sigma 1 and sigma 2. And we have some tau max. Um, so if you have your stress tensor, you can at, at some point if there's if there's some random angle where you have all of your all of your stress values in there, you can always rotate that out and there's some new angle where your stress in 2D is just uh, your principal stresses here. That's what this represents. So these two points. You can also rotate this to a point where in 2D you have, um, actually no, scratch that. Uh, but so if you remember some of our, our transformation equations for that in 2D, these are the ones you'll, you'll need to remember either how to do this more circle analysis, or you can say your, your principal stress, your first principal stress is the average of your two stresses, x, x, sigma, y, y, over two, plus square root of uh, sigma x, y, sigma y, over two, squared, uh, plus sigma x y squared um, for your principal stress one or sigma two is x y over two minus the square root sigma x x sigma y y over two squared plus sigma x y squared and this is the center point of your Mohr's circle, and this is the, the radius here of your Mohr's circle, where this point is our C. Um, so this is just a really quick flashback to stress transformations, Mohr's circle. Um, but the important thing to remember is that there's some, in every stress, in 2D or in 3D, there's some way you can pull out principal stresses. So you can always rotate that stress tensor or rotate, rotate your coordinate system to some orientation where uh, you only have principal stresses acting in tension or compression on the sample. Um, so there's a couple other useful quantities. Um, we have a tau max in 2D is just sigma xx, sigma y, y over 2. Um, in 2D. In 3D, uh, do I want to talk about that yet? No. Not yet. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay. So, when we start looking at failure for these things, let's jump over here. What I want to know uh, is a yield criterion. So here in a stress strain curve, uniaxial, um, this is some stress and some strain. What I'm really interested in finding uh, is that yield point. So over here, I have elastic in here. This is, we assume, elastic. Um, for a uniaxial tension test, I can pull out some yield strength value, which is normally how that's reported, uh, or how, how you obtain this sigma y. So with our 2% with our offset that we did in the uniaxial tension test. But the question then is, what happens if I have a more complicated state of stress? What happens if it's not just uniaxial tension on a bar or on a wire? How do I figure out where a body is going to fail 
generally. So there's a few different things. Uh, when does this for uh, some arbitrary stress And so there's, there's a few different ways that we can start to figure it out. The simplest criteria, the simplest way to think about it, is actually just to look at those principal stresses and take the maximum one. So uh, simplest one, one is a maximum normal stress. So here, this is normally what's used for brittle materials. So actually our, our chalk is a good example of this. Uh, so if I have a brittle material, internally there's going to be some defects and flaws. And when I pull on it and when I push on it in some direction, um, then eventually there's going to be some crack that goes through. One of those, one of these cracks is going to then, it's going to be the biggest crack in the body. It's going to have the highest stress concentration, and it's it's normally going to fail in tension. It's just going to kind of shoot through the sample. So you'll have some crack here that then um, causes the th whole thing to fail. In compression, um, so so in tension, we'll call this so maximum stress uh, good for brittle materials and we can say our failure criterion for this is just when sigma 1 or sigma 2 is greater than some yield strength in tension. So this failure failure happens when if I, if I pass some yield strength and tension, then there will be a big enough crack in there and it will cause it to fail. And so for our chalk in tension, uh, there's, this is, I, I intentionally chose a purple chalk uh, instead of a white chalk because they're normally more defect prone. Uh, they're just lower quality, so it's easier to break them. But so there's, a, there's some cracks, some voids in this piece of chalk. And when I pulled it in tension, um, there was some crack that was then the weakest crack, and that propagated through um, when the when that one of these principal stresses was bigger than my strength and tension. In compression, so for brittle materials, uh, for a crack to open up, it, it needs to be in tension. Um, you can also have crack opening in shear, but it's a little bit harder to do, um, or you can have cracks opening in other directions. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the in the quarter. Um, but it turns out in compression for these things, there's normally a bigger failure strength. Um, and what will happen is instead you'll get kind of a, a diagonal breaking surface. So um, what's happening here is here for, for tension, uh, you have crack opening. For compression, you actually have a different mechanism, uh, which is uh, max resolved shear. So actually, it, it's normally the, the shear that'll that'll start causing it to fail. It's still crack opening, but um, it's it's harder for that crack to open in shear and you end up with a higher strength. So here in compression you can say when sigma 1 or sigma 2 is then um, the magnitude, the magnitude is greater? No, I'll just say that is less than sigma yield in compression. Let's say this is less than or equal to. Um, so here as an example material, uh, example for soda lime glass, which is lime 
glass, which is kind of a, a common engineering glass material. This sigma y tension is something on the order of 50 MPa, and sigma y compression is something on the order of 1 GPa. So you can have over an order of magnitude difference between these two values, just because it's so much harder if you're not opening these cracks up, because cracks are generally very weak, uh, if you're not opening these up, the material is a lot, lot stronger. So anytime you hear a material, a strength reported for a brittle material, for a ceramic or for a, a brittle plastic or brittle metal, keep this in mind because it's likely very different. And if you hear a value that sounds high for a brittle material, it's probably they're reporting the compressive strength. Um, so, I'm going to grab another piece of paper. Yeah. Um, so the last sign is that because Yes, exactly. Sorry. So the, yeah, in compression here on our, I'll, I'll plot this out again, basically in our, in our Moore's circle analysis, our, our stress convention here, we'd have a negative stress. Um, so to visualize this a little bit better, uh, what we can do is plot a graph now in terms of principal stresses. So principal uh, stress plot. Was there other questions first, or was that the? Okay, cool. Um, actually, make it smaller this way. Okay, so now I'm going to make a plot here that is in terms of our, our principal stress, sigma one and sigma two. So our Moore circle, remember, was plotting the some stress, some axial stress versus some shear stress. This is now slightly different. Um, but here, so the way that we can fa we can plot our failure now for maximum uh, maximum normal stress two to two um, is. I'll take a line like this, take a line like that. Here, this is my sigma yield in tension. This is also sigma yield tension. Uh, this is our uh, sigma yield compression. This will also be a sigma yield compression. Let's draw this out. Okay, so I say now any any stress state uh, stress uh, survives or let's any any stress state that ends me up in here survives and any stress state that's outside of this block fails. So if I then have uh, as an example. If I say um, sigma yield, let's use our let's use our soda lime for an example. Um, sigma yield tension is 50 MPa. Sigma yield compression is one GPa. Uh, and I say our stress now is uh, 25 uh, zero zero minus 100, for example. This now, you can say this is already in terms of principal stresses. So your principal stress uh, 1 is just 25. <coughs> principal stress 2 is minus 100. I can say principal stress 1 is uh, less than sigma yield tension, and it's greater than uh, sigma yield compression and sigma yield, uh, our, our principal stress 2 is also uh, yield tension. So 
bo both of these are within our survival bounds. So if I were to plot this out here, principal stress one would be minus or would be 25, which would fall somewhere in the middle there. Principal stress two is minus 100, which would fall somewhere here. So I would have a, a point somewhere here in space that then still stays alive. If instead I said this was, um, if instead this was say uh, 25, zero, zero, minus 2,000, all of a sudden my point would be somewhere down, nah, some, somewhere it's still 25 on our sigma 1 axis, uh, but then minus 2,000 on our sigma y axis. So we would have uh, sigma 2 is, oh, uh, is less than our sigma yield compression. So then this goes to failure. Survives. So just kind of a, a rough idea, or a rough example of, of how we visualize this sort of a failure criterion in terms of a principal stress space. Um, and a, a quick example of, of two stress states, one that would survive and fall somewhere in here, and one that fails and would fall somewhere outside. Cool. Sound good? Questions on that one? All right. Cool. So this is the simplest, I think, I don't know if there's a simpler one. I think this is the simplest stress yield criterion we can have. So we say we figure out the principal stresses. If it's greater than one or less than the other, then it, it fails, it, either of those principal stresses. There's ways that we can make it more complicated and more interesting. So this one we're going to call a, or a second one, a maximum shear stress criterion, which is also known as a Tresca yield criterion. Um, which uh, Tresca was a French guy uh, who came up with this in 1864. I think his name is actually somewhere in the Eiffel Tower because he was just a very famous French mathematician back in the day. Um, but so uh, this particular criterion, uh, so this gives you an idea of, of kind of when these came up. Uh, so here now, before we were looking at our, our principal stresses, sigma 1, 2, and 3, now we're going to be looking at shear stresses. So this is generally true for a uh, ductile material, or generally works for ductile materials. And what we're going to say is we're going to try to find the max shear uh, in 2D, you remember uh, max shear in 2D, this is fairly straightforward. It's just sigma xx, sigma yy over 2, no matter what these two are. Um, this should also be equal to the average of your principal stresses. Do, do, do. As if you remember on our Mohr's circle plot, um, if I have two points, sigma xx, sigma y, y, or sigma 2, sigma 1, if I take the average of either of those, I still end up back here at my, at my maximum shear stress. If this is then shear and this is axial stress. Um, in 3D, it turns out we can take any of those principal stresses. So we have in 3D, uh, we have 
Yeah. So, so here, the center, if we're anywhere along that central axis, that's a max shear. And moving in the x direction changes the, the axial stress. Yes. Natural shear the towel value. It is. Uh, yeah. What? Minus? Yes, it should be minus. And a square root. And a square root. Mm -hmm. Looking at the average, looking at the average. Look at the difference. There's no square root in there. I, th I thought it was the whole R value. Part from when you're finding circle one, circle two, you have the center plus the radius. Yes. Plus the radius yeah, yeah. Ah. Plus the square root of the center plus the difference squared. Yep. Sorry, I'm totally botching this right now. Da -da -da. Um. So the square root of our x x y y over 2 squared uh, ta -ta -ta. plus sigma x y squared which should be then equal to sigma x minus sigma 1 minus sigma 2 over 2 there we go For positive direction is down, so more positive direction is down. What do you mean? For tau. Like here? Yeah, that's actually the max. The pressure is more circle. They should be equal in magnitude. Yeah, they're equal yeah. in magnitude. Sure, what you mean there? Uh, so, your tau, how you've drawn the tau, it's positive going upwards, but more circle is defined as positive going downwards. So, I mean, the magnitude is going to be the same, but for the tau max on either side. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. I I don't think it should make a difference because it's symmetric about the y axis anyway. Yeah. seen it plotted upside down. That is, huh, who was the, who was the professor for 220? Peter, wait, Peter, Peter Fazowski? McKenzie. Peter McKenzie. I know. Okay, I'm gonna have to go talk to Peter McKenzie. So, yeah, so, the equation should still hold. Um, all right, so this this equation for the radius of our Mohr circle is still generally true, and this should still be equal to the difference between the two principal stresses. All right, let's roll back. Um, now in 3D, in 3D we don't just have uh, these two principal stresses. Instead, we can define principal strains as the difference between any one of our three principal stresses. So we have uh, a sigma 1, a sigma 2, and a sigma 3. 
we can say our tau one uh, is equal to some sigma two minus sigma three over two. Uh, tau two is sigma one minus sigma three over two, and tau three three is some sigma one minus sigma two over two. Uh, to make this simpler, I can just say the absolute value of all of these guys so that we don't have to worry about it. Um, so the, ap the absolute value of these principal shears is the, mag uh, the magnitude of these principal shears is the absolute value of the difference between your principal stresses. Cool. Um, so now our failure criteria, what we're looking for is, is the max of one of these. And what we're going to say is now, because I'm, I'm looking at the difference between these two, uh, I can say my, my shear stress relates to my yield stress uh, as, as a one half. So I'm going to say, how do I want to do this? Uh, sure. So I can say now, for some tau uniaxial, uh, say I had a uniaxial tension test. Let's do it this way. Uniaxial tension, pulling on this guy uh, with some stress. This means my stress tensor is sigma with zeros everywhere else. So now my tau max is sigma minus zero over two, or just sigma over two. So in this, with this Tresca yield criterion, I'm gonna say my, my yield strength, my tau yield, is just my axial yield divided by two, where this yield strength is what we're gonna get from our uniaxial tension test. And so from this, I can say, uh, now my, my failure criterion is I'm looking for the max of all of these. So failure happens when uh, the max of sigma one minus sigma two, sigma two, sigma one minus sigma three, sigma two minus sigma three is greater than or equal to my uh, sigma yield over two. I'm gonna pull a one half out of there. Um, so when the max shear is greater than my yield shear, so this is just tau y is equal to that guy. So now what this looks like in a 3D, or no, let's do a 2D stress plot space. Um, technically this exists as a 3D one, but I cannot draw that in 3D. Um, cool, I'm gonna switch over to this one. What this now looks like in our 2D stress space, uh, if I'm looking at sigma two, sigma one, here, here. So this is now uh, in a two D in a two D space. I'm looking for the point where sigma one minus sigma two over two uh, is greater than or equal to my sigma yield over two. So the the max shear is greater than my yield shear. Da, da, da. So what this ends up looking like is I have some sigma y over here, some sigma y over here. Da, da, da. Some minus sigma y here, and some minus sigma y here. And so I kind of get this polyhedron in 2D space. There's a 3D version where this kind of extends out in all these other directions. Um, 
but now here, uh, kind of the same idea. If I'm if I'm inside this failure surface, so this survives and this guy fails. So this is known as as a I think the one before and this one now we're going to generally call our, our failure surfaces where that that surface defines the stress state where failure will start happening. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay. Cool. Sound good? Questions on that? Alright. So our third criteria that all I think I still have a little enough time to get through a little bit of. Um, there is a von Mises uh, yield criterion, which is also known as, a, as an octahedral criterion. Uh, I don't really care. Um, so this came up in 1913. So uh, half a century after the Tresca yield criterion came about, um, this guy was actually um, Austrian, but then ended up coming to the U.S. sometime, uh, sometime in the 1900, early 1900s, and was a U.S. professor. Um, not that it's terribly important, but here, this is going on a slightly different idea now, where so our two other stress criterion, maximum normal stress and maximum shear stress, are just looking at the maximum of those stresses. This one tries to come up with a more mathematical formulation for it. So the idea is that if I have somebody uh, with a hydrostatic pressure applied to it, some pressure P, uh, this will never fail. So hydrostatic pressure uh, doesn't does does doesn't cause failure. So hydrostatic pressure it in in remember every every stress state, I can come up with some diagonalized principal stress rotation state. Um, what I can do now is say the average pressure on a body. So if I have, um, if I have some sigma is sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, with some zeros around uh, the pressure hydrostatic pressure, sigma h, is equal to 1, 2, sigma 3, over 3. So I'm just taking the average of those principal stresses. And what I want to say now is, because this principal stress will never cause failure, I'm going to pull it out of my stress tensor. So now, you don't necessarily need to know this formulation, but I, I kind of wanted to show where this all comes from. Um, so now I'm going to say my stress tensor minus um, sigma h, which is a constant, times my i, times some i h. This is sigma x, y, x, z, y, z, z, y, uh, and this is symmetric minus just sigma h, sigma h, sigma h. Uh, this factors into each of those middle terms, and I'm going to call this uh, deviatoric. So that I'm going to call this my deviatoric stress. 
So this stress, this devia, oh, yeah, that's popping up there. This deviatoric stress is basically only the parts of the stress tensor that are going to cause failure to happen. So it's if I take away the hydrostatic pressure, take away this sigma h, then I end up with some deviatoric part that is the that's purely going to cause failure to happen in a material. So I can take that deviatoric thing. Um, I can take my deviatoric stress and play with some math on it. Um, I'm going to take, uh, what do I do? Three halves the deviatoric stress squared. Um, so this is, uh, I probably don't want to call this. You don't necessarily need to know this part, but I'm going to take the root of three halves, the sigma deviatoric uh, squared components, the sum of all the squares of all those components. Um, I do some math stuff, and I end up saying my, my yield criterion, which is um, when this thing is going to fail. So now failure happens when sigma yield is greater than or, or sorry, when sigma yield is less than or equal to. This is now going to be a big, long, ugly thing. Um, in 3D, this is 1 half sigma x, x, sigma y, y squared, 1 half sigma x, x uh, minus sigma or y, y minus z, z. Technically, this doesn't matter because they're squared. This is just a convention. Y, y, z, z squared. 1 half sigma z minus sigma x squared plus 3 times sigma xy squared sigma xz squared sigma yz squared. this comes under our square root. Um, now the in principle stress terms or this simplifies a little bit. We have just enough time to write this whole, whole thing out. Uh, one half sigma one minus sigma two squared one half uh, uh, two minus sigma three squared one half sigma three minus sigma one squared. So it simplifies a bit in terms of our principal stresses. Um, so now if I want to figure out where my shear failure will happen, which I should have just enough time to do. Mm -hmm. um, so say I, I do a pure shear test on some material, I have some tau that I'm applying. Uh, I can say now my sigma y uh, has to be less than or equal to if I plug in. Oh, so close. Um, lots of stuff from here. I get lots of zeros squared. Um, I end up with a three tau squared um, plus some more zeros. So. The other day I showed there was some square root 3 that came in, so this sigma y uh, is equal to root 3 tau y. This is, our, this is where our equivalent stress comes in. So in this octahedral framework, in this von Mises framework, you can say that our axial stress relates to the square root of the, of the shear yield. Um, we'll go through some examples on this tomorrow. Uh, yeah, any other questions? Homeworks are up here in the front. One and two are both graded now. Uh, please pick them up. Otherwise, I'll see you guys tomorrow.